For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. There is something almost spiritual about gardening. The slow and often tedious work of tilling the soil, planting seeds, and weeding commands a certain level of patience from us. As we kneel close to the ground, our eyes notice the small details of creation, the often overlooked yet ever important creatures and plants that sustain and nourish our fragile ecological system. As our hands work through the soil, we suddenly reconnect with the very earth from which we came. As the author of Genesis recalls, then the Lord God formed Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Indeed, gardening is a spiritual act. It is a liturgy by which we tangibly, dare I say sacramentally, encounter God and God's creation. Like all sacraments, gardening reminds us from where we come and transforms our hearts and minds through the power of God's grace. If engaged fully, spiritually, and physically, the act of gardening causes within us a desire to be more loving, more compassionate, and more kind. If you've never had a chance to garden, I hope you do one day. And if you do, I hope you allow yourself to garden with not just your body and mind, but also with your soul. Let it be a great act of worship by which you give our Creator thanks and praise for his marvelous works. I first discovered gardening many years ago while sharing a home with two friends. Initially, we had no garden, but after a long winter of sitting in the kitchen and looking out into the backyard, I got the crazy ideal, idea to till up some soil and plant some seeds. My housemates, although supportive of my endeavor, nervously looked on upon my initial endeavors. And over time, to their amazement and my own, little green sprouts emerged from the earth. Within weeks, I learned very quickly that some fruits and vegetables grow faster and more abundantly than others. Whoever knew that little cucumber seeds could produce so many cucumbers? I was shocked. I had to take baskets and baskets of cucumbers to my colleagues at work. That was a lesson I learned quickly. To my surprise, I learned very early on the spiritual dimension of gardening. Somehow the acts of tilling, planting, and weeding forced me to slow down and to listen. The repetitive acts reminded me of the rhythm of liturgy with its common prayers repeated day after day, week after week. And the fact that I garden in the evening, just after work, made me think of gardening time as a celebration of Vespers, that great evening prayer of praise unto God. As the Vesper light would fall upon the fruits of my labors, I would set aside my tools and go into my house to say Compline, or night prayers, with the words of the hymn, The day thou gavest, Lord, has ended, flowing from my mouth. Gardening taught me humility. The petty annoyances of each day passed away as I slowly worked the flower and vegetable beds. The hard labor would remind me that I'm just like every other person, weak and dependent upon God and others for love and care. And as the hours would go by, I'd realize that all my cravings and ambitions for more were nothing but dust. In truth, I was formed and fashioned to serve God's creation. And to do that, I had to connect with it. It's no wonder gardening taught me humility. 
Even the ancient Romans understood as much. With their Latin word for humility, humilitas, having at its root base the Latin word for earth, humus. Contrary to our modern misconception of humiliation as imposed shame or self-denouncement, intended to lower self-focus, the Romans, as well as other great mystics, understood humility as a sense of being grounded, knowing who we are and our place in this world, Humility, as the great spiritual masters teach, is a virtue by which we remain ever rooted in God and God's creation. <clears throat> Thus, I'm not surprised by Jesus' invitation to humility in today's gospel. He's simply reminding us to keep our feet firmly planted in the ground and to not let our heads get the better of us. Moreover, Jesus likely knew well that we humans, as soon as we allowed our pride to get the better of us, will always face a more difficult life if we are not rooted. I see this in myself. As soon as I allow my ambitions to take hold of me, that I'm forever a slave to a cycle by which I endlessly work all the time in the hope that I may one day have a higher place at the table or enjoy privileges others do not have. Shameful, I admit. But after many years of listening to people, I've come to learn I'm not alone in this. Our society repeatedly urges us to have something better and to work nonstop for bigger and better houses, cars, and technology while we all yearn to have moments of pause to be with loved ones and for moments of rest and silence. The greatest fruit of humility, however, is that it enables us to see others. When we are humble, rooted to the earth, we begin to take notice of the persons around us and see the real need that others have. This is the difficulty with humility's corresponding vice, the sin of pride. When we are proud and haughty, we solely focus on ourselves and blind, others, blind ourselves to the real suffering of others in this world. Humility, on the other hand, removes our blinders and allows us to see as God sees, that we are all a people in need of God's grace and love. So my friends, as you leave the doors of this church today, I invite you to take time to ground yourself. For those of you with gardens, spend some time in them and let your tender care of the garden be a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. For those of you who do not have a garden, go for a walk on one, one of the many trails throughout the city. Walk slowly. Listen to the sounds of the creatures around you and the flowers and grass blowing in the wind. Let yourself be enveloped by it all and recall that you are but one small part of God's wondrous creation. And let the words of Psalm 90 flow from your mouth in prayer. Lord, thou hast been a ref refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth, Wherever the earth and the world were made, thou art God from everlasting and world without end. Amen.